morning. I wanted to do a short little recording of um, this loose parts and schemas of play piece that was put together by someone named Michelle Thornhill, an educator who did a really wonderful service for us all. <laughs> um, I have put together lists and things like this myself but nothing quite this ambitious as putting it into this wonderful color-coded chart. So Michelle Thornhill, thank you so much. Um, I have made one little change to her categories and put, she had if a child loves um, and directed it at parents. So it said if your child loves. So I changed it to if a child uses so that you can translate it into a classroom. If you're a parent, of course, this is still true. <laughs> but um, we're for our purposes, I wanted to change it. And Michelle had um, boy-girl indications here, um, and I changed that to they. She said he, she, meaning all children. So we agree, she and I, Michelle and I agree that it's this is true for all children it has nothing to do with gender so i removed the gender words and put they um, just so that we're all really clear you notice she has loose parts natural loose parts large play which we you've been reading about um, already and recyclable repurposed materials additional tools and bases and then commercial toys. So I think it's really interesting that um, Michelle has designated all of these wonderful um, categories where large amounts of money don't have to be spent. So I, I appreciate that very much. Most of us don't have big budgets and we don't need them. We can easily find things especially for young children to make use of. Uh, they're not in search of very outcome-driven toys, which many of these in this list are. There's no issues. I don't have any issues with these toys, but um, they're really not necessary at all. So I uh, just wanted to acknowledge that and appreciate that about this chart that's been created for you. What I want to focus on are the schemas of play because that is what you'll be really looking at in your analysis of play and something that is not well enough understood by most early childhood educators and really needs to be. So um, let's just look at these one by one and I'll give you a brief um, overview of each one and then you'll be able to see for yourself what these items are that support that activity. So she, she being Michelle, she introduces, you know, if your child uses or does this, this could be what they might be exploring. And then these are other things that you could use. What I would say is that all children who are typically developing and don't have any physical limitations are probably going to do any one of these all day long at any time. Look at all of those schemas of play. They're amazing. Um, so uh, it's a lot to learn and it, you'll take a lifetime of observing and saying, hmm, the main thing is, is that a lot of these things that young children do that are biologically driven, the, these schemas of play are innate inside a child. They're driven by their own motivation to grow and learn and understand and explore the world. So many of them, though, cause them great um, difficulty with us as adults. Number one, usually because we don't see it as a biologically driven need to explore and understand the world. We see it as a choice of a behavior. For example, trajectory is a big one. 
What is trajectory? It's throwing, basically, or jumping off of things. And how many times do children um, find themselves in challenging relationships with us about this? Lots. So we need to provide them with ways they can throw so that that does not become problematic. And all it means is we, if they throw something that we don't want them to throw, which I would say if it's in your classroom and you've got children who are still throwing, you probably should just take it out of your classroom until that resolves. But it, you also can redirect them to things they can throw or places they can jump off. So that's the kind of thing that I really want my um, students to understand when they leave the class. I consider it a competency that you will leave the class understanding these schemas of play and how essential they are to young children and how they must be provided for in the environment. So when you go to observe, very likely you will not see this unless it's a site. Even our partner sites don't always accommodate all of this. Um, for the most part they do. So, but other places you go, you, you very likely will see mostly that kids are driven to do these things, but then they find themselves in challenging um, interactions with adults. So let's go ahead and look at these schemas and um, keep in mind all throughout how many times children are not provided these opportunities appropriately and what kind of difficulty that means for them. Notice I'm saying they find themselves in challenging relationships with us, not the other way around. <laughs> okay, so connecting is a, is a schema of play. Um, it, it is exactly what it seems to be. It's this kind of driven need to put things together, to take one thing and connect it to another. So I like that she has marker caps here because kids like, they love to make these long, long marker chains. And many times teachers will say, you know, you can't do that. So I'm asking you to let them do that. You could, you, you could recycle old markers, right? Dried up markers and let them do that. And why is it so harmful for them to do that? It's really not. It just is a matter of making sure they have things that they can connect. So look at all these opportunities here. Amazing, right? So we don't need to worry. We can just provide them with the opportunities and they'll, they'll be very satisfied with that. Trajectory, we've already talked a little bit about. This is, you know, you know um, catapulting your own body by jumping off of things, knocking things down. Um, and um, liking things to explode and project out like a, the exploding volcano thing that most classrooms do at some point. Um, just exploding materials, traje it, that's trajectory. Um, so, but throwing is the one that usually becomes problematic most of the time. Um, enclosing and enveloping, this is this innate need to um, make things wrapped up is the way I like to think about it. Um, and I always had like a gift wrapping station in my classroom where kids could wrap anything up. I just had, I called it the gift wrapping station, but they wrapped everything up. They had all kinds of things like the things that are listed here and they could just wrap things up. And, and that was a great way to satisfy that um, need. But when you see kids doing that, that is what is happening there. That's their schema of play for that. Then you have dynamic vertical, and later on she does dynamic horizontal, whoa, way down here. I don't know why those are so far apart, but um, these are, you know, these are exactly what they sound like. Things that are vertical, 
and go up and down and things that are horizontal they go across right to left left to right all of that is super important for um, play opportunities and part of building things up means knocking them down so that's another thing kids really get into difficulty with us about um, they also get into difficulty when they want to do horizontal and they want it to go from one end of the room to the other <laughs> um, so we have to find ways to accommodate these these needs and um, one of the ways we did it at my old um, kindergarten where I taught was we allowed the horizontal play to go into an area right outside of the classroom where they could make things go as long as they wanted and it wasn't a problem and we were able to monitor what they were doing and supervise it still but so they weren't out of our um, view because that's important of course so those are two things that um, we need to provide them with opportunity. You notice dropping things on purpose, scribbling up and down, building tall towers, things like that. And you can look again at all the loose parts. So um, rotation is exactly what it sounds like. Moving things around in a circle, in a you know um, circular motion, things that roll, things that spin. Um, you, you know, this is when you see little toddlers turning knobs on things. So having lots of opportunities, you can see, again, she has a wonderful list of things that would support this schema of play. So again, we've got connecting, trajectory, enclosing, enveloping, vertical dynamic, and then later on she does the horizontal dynamic. We have rotation, which is circular motion, things that kids do that are um, in a round rotation. Um, going through barriers. So this includes poking holes in things, putting your finger into things to see if you can push something or make something um, open up. This is malleable materials are great for this because you can poke your finger in Play-Doh as much as you want, right? So, um, but this need to push through things, to move things out of your way, um, to get through them, really super important. Um, here are, again, a list of many things that would work for kids to um, make use of that type of thing that type of activity. I'm thinking, you know, there's a lot of um, obstacle course kinds of things that you can also set up outside. Um, but go going through a barrier, making a barrier, and then going through it, pushing through it, knocking it down, all part of that biological need. Um, transporting things. So this is, you know, p how kids love to take something from one space and move it to another. And in our preschool and early childhood classrooms, we often prohibit that. We say, you can't bring that over into this area. Um, put it back where it belongs, that kind of thing. Kids really need the, to be able to transport things from one place to the other and use them accordingly. So you want to have that, you want to have things they can use to move things around. I used to just have cardboard boxes that they could put things in and then push, which was also helping them with some other schemas of play needs. So, um, you know, that was one simple thing without spending a lot of money well, on shopping carts and wheelbarrows. <laughs> but, um, you know, anything you can do to let them attach things to, if you have bikes that you ride outside, Anything where they can transport things is super, super important. I used to have also old suitcases that people would donate that they could pack with things and take places. Um, so that's something Im important to remember about transporting, that that's a need. And it often, again, causes difficulty with us as adults. Um, ordering and positioning, it kind of speaks for itself. This is where kid and you see kids trying to make order out of things. The main 
issue with this that adults often have is that they think they know the right order <laughs> and they want the kids to do it in the way they would do it. But it's important that we let them organize and order things in the way that makes sense to them. And two things about that. If we allow this schema of play to be used successfully, that's really great because then later on when we do need them to order and position letters, for example, to, to spell words, they already know how to exercise that skill. Now, when they're late, older, we can teach them. Well, there are some things that go in a certain order um, because you need to predict the outcome. So you always spell the word love, L-O-V-E, so it'll always say love. Um, but right now, we don't need that to happen yet. We need them to develop the schema of play, which is the ability to create their own systems of organization. Uh, transformation. So this is you know, the idea that anything can be transformed into anything. And that should be allowed to happen as much as possible. The development of that schema is essential to every single aspect of life as an older child and as a grown-up. You have to be able to imagine transformation and possibilities. Um, so it's really important that this is supported. We've talked about horizontal dynamic and then orientation and perspective, another one where kids really get into challenging relationships with us because they often want to stand on top of things and look down on things. We need to provide them with safe ways to do that because it's an important part of their development. And we need to give them lots of different ways, things to look through, things to um, explore in terms of what perspective it allows them to have. We need to let them lie down outside and not say you'll get your clothes dirty. So things like that really need to be happening. Um, we need to find safe things they can jump off of so that they can look down and jump. Um, lots of different things that need to be happening. And you notice she has a lot of ideas here for you to use that are safe and ways to allow kids to um, change their orientation and perspective, which they really need to do. Imagine a world where that's limited from an older child and an adult, that you cannot take another perspective. Um, really a problem in life, right? So we don't want that. So all of these schemas of play have significance later on in older children's learning and in our adult lives. All of these schemas of play are incredibly essential building blocks to thinking and they form in play. That we cannot teach these. Um, they are biological drives to understand and the world cognitively in their thinking. If we do not allow for the play, we're gonna disrupt their ability to, to think this way and that will disrupt um, their success later on to one degree or another. So um, these schemas of play are so, so important that I've gone ahead and made it your analysis of play assignment two. I want you to dive deeply into finding these and watching these and looking at how sp different schools provide for them. All right, I hope that's helpful in your understanding of this.